One of the many common problems, um, especially for people that are converting ex ambulances where they haven't removed all the old, redundant, useless bits and pieces of leftovers from the vehicle when it was serving as an ambulance, is they get problems with the chassis battery going flat. It's not just limited to ambulances. Parasitic loads on vehicle chassis batteries are increasingly common and wherever possible it's a simple case of removing anything that's redundant. Odd bits of equipment that are sometimes wired up to the chassis battery. Normally in ex-ambulances the bits and pieces are connected up to the auxiliary batteries but you do get situations in ex-ambulances where you're getting a higher than acceptable uh, parasitic load on the chassis battery. So I'm just emulating that today with this little LED light here connected to my, we call the small battery, the uh, chassis battery. Or um, for those of you in America, I guess you call it your, your engine or your start battery. And we we'll pretend that that great big one at the back there is my auxiliary battery. And as I said, you Yanks, you like to call it a house battery. But I'm, in, I'm British, so that one over there is going to be the um, auxiliary battery. And this one here is going to be the chassis battery. Right now, my pretend parasitic load, my LED light down there, is drawing about the clamp. Let's see what we're drawing. 250 milliamps, quarter of an amp. That's extreme for a healthy vehicle chassis battery. Um, my craft draws about 70 milliamps, 0 0.07 of an amp. Um, when the vehicle's turned off, once all the electronics have gone to, peak, to sleep. And that's uh, as a result of the uh, Android head unit I've got in there. That's got a backup supply, and I've got two alarms and a tracker. <clears throat> and they're all running off the chassis battery, um, or are their own battery backups, which are powered by the chassis battery. So I've got a known parasitic load in my vehicle. If I saw 250 milliamps as a constant parasitic load, I'd be a bit concerned what that is, and I'd probably go looking for it. Um, by isolating circuits in a vehicle just to try and clarify exactly where it's coming from. Just in case there's something in the vehicle you don't know about. Um, I worked on a, a Peugeot not long ago that had a speed limiter and that speed limiter was permanently drawing 0.3 of an amp. Um, the owner didn't even know the speed limiter was still there but it, it was there. So one of the things that people struggle with is how do you charge your chassis battery when your vehicle's parked up for weeks on end and you're not using it between trips without plugging it into mains hookup or connecting the mains battery charger. And you can buy various um, bi-directional chargers. Renault G do two now, they do the, well they do three, they do the DCC, DC? DCC 50S and DCC 30S, which are solar controllers and combined DC, DC to DC battery chargers. And they have the beauty of when there's enough solar voltage, when the chassis battery is fully, uh, when, sorry, the auxiliary battery is fully charged, it will trickle charge the chassis battery. Um, Renogy has also brought out um, a 60 amp uh, Rego charger, which also does bi-directional charging. And I'm sure there's other companies that do bi-directional chargers as well. Um, there are some limitations. Obviously, they're quite expensive, and some people don't like single points of failure. You can also buy battery maintainers. Sterling do one called the BB1212-3, I think it's called. It's got slightly more intelligent electronics in it than... Uh, some, but Voltronic do one called a, I think they call it a battery maintainer, and it's effectively nothing more than what I'm about to show you inside it. I think they charge about 30 quid for them, so they're not massively expensive. I, in my own van, have a, a device made by a company called AbleMail. It's the AbleMail AMT12-2. It's a programmable battery maintainer. It was quite expensive to buy, uh, and in order to program it properly, you have to have a Bluetooth interface, which is also quite expensive to buy. And frankly, the thing isn't worth the money. I wouldn't buy another one. Um, I'm quite disappointed in it, actually. I'd much rather, I think I would have been better off spending the money on one of the Renogy devices and actually using it uh, as a DC to DC and MPT, MPPT controller as well. But the Able Mail has the ability to deal with smart alternators and it has the ability to deal with different chemistries and different voltages. But... What I'm going to show you shortly is a very, very simple way of making a DIY um, battery maintainer. Now, previous video I was talking about diodes and how they're used for um, headlight management. And that is that why 
configured diode harness that I was using in the previous video. I'm only going to use one diode for this exercise because I only need one diode but let's just go through what this does. It's worth mentioning that whenever there's any sort of load on the battery you can't rely on the voltage of that battery to give you an indication of its state of charge. I've had this um, LED light down here do, 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 connected for a good hour and a half, two hours because this little tiny battery was 100% charged before I started and I just wanted to knock some uh, current out of it and reduce the voltage slightly. But under load, this battery is showing, if you look at the meter, 12.1 volts. Typically off load, nothing connected to it, a healthy 12 volt battery would normally be 12.7, 12.8. If I go up to my chassis battery, at the top here, sorry, my uh, pretend auxiliary battery, this is 100% charged, it's actually a brand new battery that I took out the Iveco, 12.96 um, volts. That's a very good resting voltage, nice high resting voltage. What I've actually got over here, just move the DVM out of the way for a moment, is one of the diodes I mentioned earlier. And if, if you didn't watch the video, we just explain it. A diode simply allows DC electricity to flow through in one direction. So what I've got there is connection to the plus 12 volts of my pretend auxiliary battery into the diode. The cathode of the diode is at that end, so electricity can flow through the diode that way, but not back that way. It can't go that way around, it can only go that way around. In other words, this battery is the source, and this battery is the target. This battery can, when it's connected, it's not connected at the moment, but this battery can provide a trickle charge to this battery, but this little battery, pretending to my chassis battery, can't discharge itself through to this battery. And the way this is set up at the moment, electricity flows down the wire, through the diode, and say, so forget this leg here, this is just the other diode from the previous um, video, down a bit wire there, and into a light bulb. Is it in focus? Focus? A light bulb. This is a straightforward 50 watt halogen light bulb cable through there and then comes out goes over that crocodile clip which connects to nothing what's the light bulb doing you think obviously the fuse is to protect the circuit the diode is to stop the voltage from the chassis battery leaking back to the auxiliary battery if you got into a situation where the chassis battery was a higher voltage than that what the light bulb does is it acts as a current limiter the voltronic device has something similar a similar electronic component in there it's a current limiter. A light bulb, a tungsten light bulb or a halogen light bulb, a filament light bulb as opposed to an LED light bulb, is effectively a dead short. And you pass electricity through it, and because it's dead short, it glows hot and gives off light. But the important thing is it's a dead short. When that is acting as a light bulb, the wattage of the light bulb determines how much current it can draw. So that light bulb, 55 watt light bulb, if you work it out roughly in your head, if it was 60 watts divided by 12 volts, it's 5. So the maximum current that bulb can actually allow to flow through it, if it was at full brightness, is around about 5 amps. So you effectively are limiting the amount of current that can actually throw through the entire circuit to 5 amps. But that would only be, the only way that would ever be the maximum 5 amps is if you were actually feeding to ground, a short circuit. Your chassis battery would have to be virtually dead as a dodo and dead short for that to be drawing five amps from your auxiliary battery. So we just take the little crocodile clip just to prove the light bulb works and just to show you the circuit actually physically works. 12 volts, down there, down there, around there, to the light bulb, out of here. We'll connect that to ground and Bob's your uncle, the bulb comes on. If I put the current clamp on there, we're seeing... Oh, we can't see it. Blah. Four point nine amps. So that's the maximum current that bulb will allow to flow. And there you have a circuit flowing through the diode via the fuse 
back to ground and it's just basically I've just turned a light bulb on. The fact that the diode's in the circuit is irrelevant. The diode's just allowing the, the voltage to flow. The important thing to measure, to, or one of the important things to realise, is a diode has a volt drop across it. All diodes have volt drops across them. There's one volt drop across that at the moment. That may be because the diode's getting hot. But there's one volt being dropped across that diode. My battery is currently measuring 12.1 volts. And as you saw earlier on, my simulated auxiliary battery is measuring about 12.9 volts. With my simulated parasitic load of quarter of an amp, this battery voltage is now measuring 12.1. If I take my connection from my light bulb over there and connect it to the positive of this battery, The light bulb doesn't come on, and very little has happened on the voltage of the battery itself. And that's because we have got this volt drop across the diode of anything between 0.6 of a volt. So right now, my pretend auxiliary battery is still at about 12.9, 12.8 volts, accounting for the volt drop across the diode. We are providing hardly any extra voltage and therefore hardly any extra current will flow into my simulated chassis battery. In this scenario, middle of night, whatever you want to call it, your auxiliary batteries are being used as they normally would be. Um, the voltage is dropped down slightly on your auxiliary battery to 12.7 or thereabouts volts, 12.6 or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Allowing for the volt drop across the diode the chassis battery voltage is probably high enough that no current's flowing, which is good. Come the next day, or perhaps your vehicle's parked up somewhere in the middle of nowhere for days on end because you haven't used it on your drive or in your garage or out on the road, solar comes along. I should emulate that with this little battery charger I've got here. And we raise the voltage from our solar controller to what eventually will be around about 14 volts or thereabouts. It's 13.6 at the moment. And now what we will start to see, if we measure the voltage, once I reconnect it, if we measure the voltage across our chassis battery, there. You can now see the chassis battery is starting to charge. I'm going to disconnect that red wire and reposition that so you can see better what I'm doing. Whack that on there and you can see 1.5 amps, 1.4, it's dropping rapidly, and that's because the voltage of the battery is increasing. The current is 1.5 amps, and the voltage on the battery is 12.7 volts. That's really healthy already. So what you can see is we're trickle charging the battery, 1.5 amps. The voltage has risen nicely. to a good healthy voltage. The important thing to understand is as this voltage of this battery equalizes or, or equalizes minus the volt drop across the diode, the current will drop to virtually zero. And again, all that light bulb is doing is just acting as a current limiter. It's not 100% necessary, but you need something. Otherwise, um, if this chassis battery was dead flat, maybe you've been cranking the engine for ages and you completely flattened it and the voltage was down to, I know, 10 and a half, 11 volts or something, without a current limiter, you'd pop the fuse or burn the diode out because the battery would draw a massive amount of current initially. Um, if you ever had a situation where this sort of circuit was connected up and the light bulb was actually glowing, 
your target chassis battery would be virtually dead short and there'd be something horribly wrong with it. Dead short or dead, 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 dead. Totally dead. Um, so there's a very simple, very crude way using a fuse. And the fuse just needs to be rated at what the maximum current of the bulb could be. Um, a fuse, a diode, and a light bulb. And the light bulb, you know, as long as it's anything really, two, three amp light bulb, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, if it obviously needs to be mounted in something sensible, a small light housing, because just a bare light bulb clamped in a vice isn't very sensible, chances are the glass is going to get smashed. But you can see that voltage on the battery now is up to 13. Oh. These terminals and this battery are way past their best and they don't uh, connect very well. 13.08 volts already. And that's all the time my pretend parasitic load is there. And we're still at 1.3 amps. Now, if I turn off my pretend solar panels, which is currently my little CTEC battery charger, if I disconnect that, what will happen is the voltage of my auxiliary battery will drop down to 12.8, 12.9 volts. This current here, because the voltage on this battery will be almost equal to the voltage on that battery there, minus the volt drop across the diode, that current will trail away to next to nothing. So I'll just unplug that now. And you can see that current dropping off straight away. It's down a quarter of an amp, and that will virtually drop off to next to nothing once the voltage is equalised. So there's virtually no way you can accidentally flatten your auxiliary batteries trickle charging your chassis battery using this method overnight which is what some people might be worried about but during the day or at least whenever there's enough voltage at this battery it will also trickle charge this one now it's been a bit long-winded this um hopefully it's made sense to people any questions feel free to ask but what i wanted to show really was you can keep your chassis battery charged with nothing more than a fuse, a diode, and something to limit the current. Mounted in some sort of housing just to protect the glass. The bulb's never going to come on or should never ever come on. You just need to stop it from going, getting smashed rather than ever blowing. There you go. Now, last thing to mention probably is the uh, type of diode. The diode in this particular circuit is called a P600B. It's a 6 amp diode. Um, that's what it's rated at. Um, and that's what was originally in the headlight wiring for my examples. And I've just used it for this experiment. There you go. Thanks for watching.